Greetings, welcome to Lunar Burn Studios. In this video, we're going to talk about, well, we're going to finally talk about mixing slurry. Ultimately, I'm going to show you how to do a batch mix. I already, my tanks are already, you know, about half full. I just really just kind of want to top off the tank, but the process that we're going to utilize is pretty much the same as it will be if we were starting off with a fresh mix. Um, in the previous few videos, and, and there'll be a few links right here and in the description below, we talked about not only you know safety, good safety practices for working with ceramic shell, but we also talked about you know the perks of why we want to use ceramic shell, and then the components of the slurry that will go into you know that we'll, we're going to utilize today while we mix. My ceramic shell mix, when it's all boiled down to it, is pretty straightforward. The main components, colloidal silica and silica flour, are it's basically two to one, one part colloidal two parts flour. Then I also use a suspension agent, and I'll talk more about that here shortly. But for the initial uh, mix, the bags of silica I get come in 55 pounds. So I'm gonna use that as my unit of measure. So that way I don't have like half bags, you know, kicking around the studio. So with 55 pounds, I'm gonna use, wind up using 110 pounds of the silica flour and 55 pounds of the colloidal silica. So my slurry has been sitting for a couple of days. So I brought, I, earlier today, I went ahead and put the mixing, mixing blade in. And it's been mixing for a couple of hours just to kind of get everything evenly fluffed up in, in, in a nice consistent manner. The tank I have, um, I use a, a modified 55 gallon barrel. So it ultimately holds about a, about 35, 40 gallons. I have an old drill press that I use, you know, picked it up for 50 bucks. Um, I did change out the motor, so it's a continuous motor 220. So I'm just using an old uh, standard, you know, mixing blade. Sold as a, for mixing paint. You can get it at a lot of the, you know, Home Depots or big box stores, um, but it also is durable enough to mix up uh, um, drywall mud and spackling and whatnot. So, but anyway, but this is just, you know, this is all I'm using and stuff and it creates enough torque and, and uh, turbulence um, and a nice smooth mix without aerating and, and drawing any actually additional air into the, into the mixture. Colloidal silica, which I'll weigh off, you know, I, I buy that in a 55 gallon drum, although you can buy it in its uh, five gallon containers as well. But since I'm getting it in a 55 gallon drum, I'll need to uh, use a pump, siphon it off um, out of the, the larger tank, distill it from on, into a smaller bucket, which will be roughly 10 pounds of material. Cause it's really, this ratio works best by weight, not volume. And I, it's roughly a one gallon bucket and I know that it will hold pretty close to, pretty much up to this level here, up to this ridge. This last ridge before the top is rough, typically about 10 pounds. So that's what I'm gonna go for. Although I'm not gonna trust that just by sight, I will measure it. And there we go. Um, yeah, right at 10 pounds. So we're gonna do five and a half, or four and a half more of those. And this pump prefers to be slow and methodical. I'm gonna try not to make a mess. Tilt up the nozzle, get that out of the way. You always want to add the liquid first, let that mix for, for a bit. So I get one homogenous you know, mixture. And let me go ahead and grab a bag here of my RP1 Remet, few silica, and I'm gonna use a knife to cut off, you know, cut up the top here, but just instead of just randomly slicing this thing open, I'd like to slice around three quarters of the perimeter and actually so the top of the bag opens like a lid. 
Partly so if I, in other situations, if I'm not utilizing the whole bag, it makes it easier to close up the bag, but then also I'll save these bags for the refuge of the, of the spent ceramic shell after the pour, just because it's, it's nicer than just dumping it loose into the trash. We have our, our cloidal in the tank, and so what we, the next step is we want to introduce the bentonite, which is what I'm going to use as my suspension agent. And ultimately, I talked about all these all these ingredients more specifically in the previous video, and you can see, you know, check out some links here, and there'll also be links in the description, and where I you know really talk about you know kind of the nuances of the different materials I'm using. But in this case, I am using a um, an enhanced binder, and I can get away with just using uh, 325 mesh bentonite. Um, to aid in my suspension. Uh, bentonite is a silt clay, super, super fine. And if we take it and just dump it into the slurry, it's just gonna float. It's not gonna incorporate. And I've tried a variety of different ways over the years, you know, whether to uh, slip it, basically pre-mix it in water and add it as a, almost like a syrup or an, extra, an additional batter to the slurry. Um, but again, on its own, it still wants to just float to the top. So you know, my typical mix is the you know, or my, my typical batch is the 55 pounds of colloidal liquid and two 55 pound bags of mycelical flour. And with that ratio, I found that roughly a quarter pound to a third of a pound of bentonite, three 325 mesh uh, bentonite is enough to actually keep it suspended. And you really want to try not to add too much more bentonite to it or have too little, it's kind of the sweet spot. But anyway, so mix that up with about 10 pounds of flour, dry mix it, the, the, the silica particles from the bentonite will, will bind and kind of cling to the, the silica flour. And then when you introduce that into your slurry mix, it, it blends right in and it basically, you know, takes those, uh, the bentonite particles and uh, basically puts weights on them and allows that uh, the, that light material to be introduced and drawn into the into the mix. And one of the tricks with the flour is that you don't want to just dump it all in. You know, really, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to introduce the flour in a subtle, slow enough way that we, because we, we want to need every particle, every little crystal of silica to get fully wet, fully surrounded by that slurry liquid. And if we just dump it in, in clumps, well, we'll wind up with a chunky mixture and stuff like that. And it'll take longer for the, 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 the material to wet in. The, the first bag goes in pretty quickly because the, the mixture's uh, thinner. As we're adding the material, we'll add it, you know, a cup at a time, you know, let, letting it slowly absorb and mix into, into the mixture. And as that mixture gets thicker and thicker, it's gonna take longer and longer uh, for that to absorb, even, and then ultimately to a point where it'll seemingly get super thick, almost like pancake batter. And I'll utilize a, a, a power, an extra hand mixer to help incorporate those materials together. Now, one of the things we want to, you know, when we first get done mixing this, this material and get all of our material added into it, it's going to seem super thick and super chunky. And so, but, you know, like I said earlier, we want, we're going to, we want to mix it long enough that we get all the particles to fully wet in. And you can see where those last couple of batches, it was getting super thick, taking a lot more effort, especially, you know, which is why I utilized the second hand drill uh, to, to slowly, you know, incorporate the mix. Now you'll notice I didn't just plunge a mixture in there and pump it up on high right off the bat. I tried to run it as slowly as possible to 
fold in, slowly fold in the, that dry material into the wet. Um, and then once I got it predominantly all the way in, then I did speed up the hand mixer um, to, to create a little bit more um, aggressive turbulence and to dis, uh, disperse the silica um, into the slurry. So now this material is actually relatively, relatively thick. Although, you know, much, much thinner than, than pancake batter. It's definitely not that. Maybe like a buttermilk, heavier than a buttermilk. So that's giving me a pretty decent consistency. Nice even coating. But what I'm gonna do, do next is that, ultimately I'm gonna let this mix until tomorrow morning. Um, it's, it, it's, you know, 10 o'clock at night. Um, and I definitely wanted to let it mix for a while. I, I would want to mix it for at least about four to five, four to six hours. But at this point, I'm just gonna go ahead and let it mix overnight. Now, the one thing I'm gonna to wanna to do to check my viscosity, as much as I can, I know what I'm looking for by sticking my hand into the mix. Ultimately, the way you wanna do it is use a, a number five Zahn cup. It's used for uh, testing viscosity. Uh, typically used with painting and whatnot, but in this situation, it's the same principle. So I'm going to plunge this in, pull it out, and let it drain out. And when I'll get a nice continuous stream. And when that stream starts to break within about an inch or so of the bottom of the cup, I'll end my timing. And so that's what I'm going to do is, is, is time the mix. And what I'm looking for is when the stream breaks at about an inch or so from the bottom of the cup. So you want to make sure you rinse everything out. You don't want silica settling and, and crusting up and, and impeding the hole that's at the bottom of the Zahn cup. Um, and so I like to hang them up. You know, the, the tendency with these handles is to hang them like this, but then stuff settles in, in right around that orifice. So what we want to do is hang them up so they're upside down and they drain clean, clearly, cleanly. So to leave this mixture overnight, I don't want to just leave, leave with the tank open. I am going to Grab a plastic bag and I have kind of a slice in it so I can accommodate the mixing blade. Making sure to keep it out of, out of harm's way or proximity so it doesn't get bound up in the, in the blade itself. And then my lid as well has a slice in it to accommodate the blade. And this is just to keep the moisture from evaporating off too much. Try to keep things hydrated as much as possible. And then also to keep any other kind of random debris from falling into the tank. Okay, so we're, we're good to go. The slurry has been uh, thoroughly mixed up. You know, we had our recipe of two to one, one part colloidal, two parts flour. We added a, about a quarter pound of bentonite to help act as a suspension agent. The final component that we want to add into the slurry is a, a color indicator or a dryness indicator. Now, the, this product um, sold by, you know, Remet. And, um, and so what this is, is that it, the slurry itself, when it's, if we make, if we don't add any color into it, the slurry is kind of a, a, a light gray color. And then as it dries, it goes to a slightly lighter gray color. So it's really tough to gauge when it's dry and when it's not dry. By adding the color indicator, it turns the slurry green or kind of a pale green color. And then 
but as it dries, it dries to kind of a yellowish orange color, depending on uh, how much colorant you actually have into it. If you put in, you know, quite a bit, it'll be, you know, bright green to bright orange. For this batch of, of slurry, typically I'll just add one cap of this material. Now this stuff is um, particularly nasty um, in its powder form. It's actually a, a heavy carcinogen. Uh, which is why it's not so sold in its powder form. And so they'll pre-suspend it in a liquid and set, sell it this, this way. That way it keeps it from being airborne. But also it's heavily concentrated. So if you get this stuff on your skin, it will stain your, your skin uh, for uh, several days. You can't, you can't wash it off. So you do want to make sure you're wearing your rubber gloves. So what we want to do is go ahead and fill up our cap full of... Uh, of the color indicator and then we'll pour it in and add it into the into the slurry and so as i add it in you can see how it starts you know kind of swirling in um, you can see how bright yellow it is right at the moment although it's interesting how it starts off kind of orangey in this wet color but actually turns the slurry green and it will go back to that orange color as it dries now one of the components of the dry indicator when it was for industry standards it's really not an indicator that the shell is 100% dry and ready for the next dip. The, how they use the dryness indicator is to see if your pattern is drying evenly. So depending on your air sources and how you have your fan set up, and you know you want to you know you want your shells to dry as evenly um, as possible over the entire surface. You don't want to just have one fan have it dry on one side unless you know the pieces are rotating somehow. So really this is more of a kind of a test thing to make sure your shells are drying on an even, even thing. Now for our use at this scale, the, when the shells are kind of a bright orange or you know, and there is no more green on the, on the shells, even though it's not a necessarily technically 100% dry, it's pretty damn close. So once we get to that point, then we let it dry just a little bit longer and we're typically good to go. But it is super helpful to be able to see like what nooks and crannies, you know, tight spaces that might still be green as opposed to yellow. And it's just, you know, it makes life a lot easier in being able to determine when your shells are dry. Because one of the things we want to remember is that the, this material as it dries becomes water impermeable. So if you do a dip, and you do your next dip and the previous dip isn't fully dry, it's gonna trap moisture inside your shell. You can't just you know, do a double dip and let it dry twice as long. It doesn't work that way. So you wanna really make sure that each layer is thoroughly dry. Um, and then ultimately, if you wind up trapping moisture into your, in, inside the shell, if it's on the first couple layers, the first couple layers could delaminate and you're gonna lose your detail. If it's on a coarser coat, it'll more than likely actually cause a crack in the shell, which could potentially be a leak later on down the line. And if you ever at a point when you think it's like going, oh, is it close? Just go ahead and give it another half an hour or adjust the fans, try to attack that area that's still, you know, seemingly maybe a little bit wet and really make sure that this, each one is dry. Okay, so and so ultimately that's one of the reasons why we really like to use the, the dryness indicator. It's not, not critical, but it certainly makes life a lot easier. So we finally have our slurry mixed. It's ready to go. So one of the things we want to do is we need to, you know, verify that our, our patterns, whether they be wax or uh, PLA, are properly sprued. And if you need some insight on that, uh, there's links for um, uh, up above for a playlist um, where I talk about sprueing and wax working and tools and safety and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, be sure to check that out if you haven't done so already. In the next video, we're going to start dipping shell and really talking about the components into it. You know, it's more than just you need to dip your wax in, into the slurry 10 times and you have a shell and so like that. There's a lot of uh, kind of theory and approach for us to produce the best shells possible that are gonna withstand both the burnout and the pour. Feel free to ask questions and or at least suggestions in the comments below. Hit the like button if you're if you got something useful from this. You know, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And as always, until the next video, be creative and be safe.